Welcome uh, to this week's program of Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin, and today we have a very special program high above uh, beautiful San Francisco in the offices of uh, Dwayne Morris Law Firm. Our, our guest today is uh, Matt uh, Tarver-Walchrist, who is CEO of the ARC San Francisco. And uh, our other interviewers are my co-host, Will Burnick, and uh, a founder of Ascend, Camilla Bixler. And to begin with, I always have to ask uh, Will, what's with your shirt? I'm glad you asked. This, this year's, this, our first, my first shirt of the year is mine, is one of, is my Chinese New Year's shirts. And as, as some of you may know, next, as some of you may know, next month is Chinese New Year. Last year was the year of the dog, which, which would explain what this, which which would explain the shirt. So, so, so now we have so now Chinese New Year starts again next month. So, so and and this since this year is the year of the pig. Um, I think then that we will begin uh, with you, Will, uh, and uh, introduce our guest, uh, Matt Tarver Walquist. Could you take it, please? Tell us about your current position as head of the ARC San Francisco in relation to the autism community. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. First of all, thanks for having me here. And Will, I love your shirt. And uh, yeah, my name is Matt tarver Walkwist. I'm the new CEO at the ARC San Francisco. I started there in mid-August, so I've been there for about five and a half months. And the ARC San Francisco, we are a service provider for people with disabilities and differences, and we really see ourselves as a center for lifelong learning for our community, and we do a lot of work with the autism community. We serve a number of people on the autism spectrum, and we also partner with Ascend, who holds their meetings at our office, and we partner with the Specialist Guild, which is a small organization that pursues tech employment for people with autism. You know, at the ARC San Francisco, we do a number of things. We try to sort of look at the entire spectrum, so, so to speak, of someone's life. And we look at their life skills and their ability to live independently in the home. We look at people's uh, educational goals and try to construct curricula and classes to help them pursue the education they want. And a major focus of ours is employment. Uh, we understand that people with autism are severely underemployed and not because of a lack of ability or a lack of desire, but because um, for various unfortunate reasons, they are a largely marginalized group, sometimes an invisible group. And part of our job is to make that community visible and to give them the skills to go out and advocate for themselves and find jobs they want to do and to work on all the skills that are needed in employment. You know, part of that is a discovery process. It's trying to understand what your interests are, what your skills are, what you would like to do, what areas of the world you would like to work in. And then it's what steps are needed in order to find a job. You know, we need to work on building resumes, working on interview skills. And then on the job, we provide job coaching to help people become successful in their employment. So that was kind of a long summary of what we do. And that was only, that only scratches the surface, but that's who I am and that's what we do. Tell us about your background. Well, I have been working in the developmental services field in the San Francisco Bay Area for about 17 years. Um, prior to my position at the ARC San Francisco, I was the vice president and COO at LifeHouse. LifeHouse is a nonprofit service provider for people with developmental disabilities. And when I was at LifeHouse, we put a really strong focus on building our skills at serving people with autism. And we started something called the Marin Autism Collaborative that I've been a part of. Even before I was at LifeHouse, I was part of the collaboration. I've been a part of it for about the past 10 years. And it puts on educational events. It runs support groups for parents. I've facilitated a number of support groups for, for parents and family members of people on the autism spectrum. Prior to when I worked at LifeHouse, I was the direct director of residential services at the Cedars of Marin another service provider, uh, providing services for people with developmental disabilities, including autism. And prior to that, where I got my first job, was a small nonprofit in San Rafael, California, called Opportunity for Independence. And that was my sort of gateway into this field. 
and the way that happened was really accidental. And you know, maybe today I'll get an opportunity to talk about some of my ideas for the future because I would like people's entry into this field to be less accidental than mine, though in most cases it's either accidental or it's because someone has a family member or knows someone with autism. But I was, I had graduated from college, I lived abroad for a while, and I had just moved to the San Francisco Bay Area. I was living in Berkeley just because that seemed like a really cool thing to do. And I was just finding myself in my early to mid 20s doing a bunch of random jobs. And at the time I was working, um, running the marketing campaign for a drinkable yogurt product. And wasn't particularly satisfying and I sort of took stock of where I was in my life and I decided to go back to school. And in going back to school, I still needed to support myself and have health benefits. So I tried to find a job that I could work a whole bunch of hours in a few number of days so I could qualify for benefits. And I wanted to work for a nonprofit and be in service. So I got on Craigslist and I found a job working as a direct support professional in a group home for four men with developmental disabilities who all had behavioral issues and had um, some challenges that were an impediment to them being fully integrated members of the community. What, have your, what are some of your priorities going forward in working with the autism community? I have a number of priorities. Um, there are a number of challenges we face as service providers. Now, you know, when it comes to the autism community, I see three major areas that in my role I, I need to address. One of them is housing, another one is employment, and the other is the overall structure of the services system. And now that's a complicated one. I'll start with that one. That one that's a little more complicated to explain, but you know, the, the developmental s services system that we have here in California, which is funded by the state, overseen by the Department of Developmental Services, was established by the passing of the Lanterman Act in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And that was a great law that created a legal entitlement for people with developmental disabilities to receive services in their community as opposed to being placed in institutions. And that's what creates this whole system that we work in. That's what created the regional center system. And in the Bay Area, Golden Gate Regional Center, which provides the majority of the funding to the ARC San Francisco. Now, as that system has developed over the decades, the services that have evolved didn't necessarily take the needs of people with autism into account. And so the, the whole system has kind of been created. And then over the last couple of decades, as I have witnessed, because this is, this is when I've been working in the field, there's been this huge demographic change where the primary needs coming through the system are for people with autism. Now, people with autism, as I do not need to tell the people at this table, are people. You meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. You haven't necessarily learned how to serve a whole spectrum and a whole community. So the needs are diverse and they require very individualized supports. And the system is struggling, I think, to adapt to how to do that with the funds that are available. And one of the priorities in my role is to help advocate for a system that has sufficient funding to provide those needs and empowers service providers like the ARC San Francisco to be flexible enough to be able to address the individual needs of each person with autism that needs our services. Now, a big, a big problem is housing, as I mentioned. Um, needless to say, the San Francisco Bay Area is one of the most expensive places in the world to live. And people with autism, because they've often been deprived of opportunities for employment, often don't have the income necessary to live in San Francisco. Oftentimes, neither do people who work at Google, neither do software engineers. It's a really difficult problem. And affordable housing is a real crisis in San Francisco. And it's something that the entire community really needs to address. Now, one of my priorities is making sure that people with autism are part of the conversation when it comes to groups that need to be considered when we're talking about developing affordable housing and making housing available to people. Because if we as a community value a diverse community, value all of the different shades and personality types and, you know, and different and neurodiversity in our community, then we need to make sure that it's a priority that we keep that community and not make the Bay Area just the playground of wealthy elites where everyone else is having to live off in far-flung places that are more affordable to live. There is a, a, a big affordable housing discussion happening 
on the front pages of the newspaper. But when you read those articles, you're not necessarily seeing the word neurodiversity. You're not seeing autism. You're not seeing developmental dis disability. So we need to get that demographic on the front pages as a priority when we're looking at these things. And you know, one of the ideas I'm interested in pursuing is you know, when, when now regional center eligibility is a whole other issue for people with autism. Some of them are eligible for regional center, some are not. And that's, that's, a, that's another problem in itself. But just for, for the purposes of this topic and housing, let's say w if we looked at regional center eligibility and somehow found the political will and, and success to tie regional center eligibility to some kind of housing voucher so that if someone comes through the system, they don't have to go through the years and years of waiting to see if they can get some kind of subsidy for their housing, but that being eligible for regional center immediately qualifies them. That could make great steps in addressing the, I would say, demographic crisis we're facing in the Bay Area, which is that there's nowhere for the folks that we want to provide services to who identify as people who live in the Bay Area, who are part of the culture here, there's nowhere for them to live. So we need to work really hard to find that. Now, the other priority area I mentioned was employment. Now, that's something that I'm very proud of what the Arc San Francisco does. It's one of the main reasons that I chose to work at this organization. Um, I'd say unlike any other organization I've seen, the Arc San Francisco has been very successful in demonstrating to companies and to people who hire people that the population that we support can be valuable and productive employees. And it's there's been a shift over the again over the last 10 or 15 years at the state at the regional center level making employment a priority, right? Employment you you hear the terms employment first all the time, which is that the services system is not there to just be a group of professional babysitters who keep people safe and who feel sorry for people, but who are there to take a diverse part section of our community find their strengths and help them come and be part of the community and contribute to society. And that's something we at the Arc San Francisco do with our employment program where we help people get jobs, get good jobs, good, good jobs at prestigious companies like Amazon and Salesforce, California Academy of Sciences, I can go on and on. And when we do that, employers get to see that it can be a very successful model. And what we've been explaining to companies and employers is by employing people supported by the Arc San Francisco, by employing somebody with autism, you're not doing it as an act of charity. You're not doing it to make yourself feel good about yourself. You're doing it because it's a good business decision, because data has shown that when you employ the, the people that we're connecting you to, they have better retention. They stay, they stay at the job longer. They have better attendance. You know, you're talking about a whole population that is underemployed, that has been deprived of opportunities, and when given an opportunity, for the most part, they take it. And they enjoy it, and they run with it, and they enrich the workplace. And we've had tremendous success with that. You know, just the other night, I was at an event at the California Academy of Sciences, and it was an event put on by the Arc San Francisco's Business Advisory Committee. And that committee is composed of different businesses that employ people supported by the Arc San Francisco. And that event is basically a networking event where they invite other businesses and they say, "Look at what a great thing this is. Look at how much this can, this can you know enrich your workplace." And it's also a way to educate businesses. A lot of businesses now are interested in diversity and inclusion, you know, which basically means let's make sure that our company isn't just a bunch of white guys, right? We're not just a bunch of white males. We want, we want our company to reflect the community as a whole. We want to make sure that we're getting input from people who have different life experiences, and that can enrich our business and make us better at what we do. And we say diversity inclusion is very important. Don't forget about neurodiversity. That is part of it. And sometimes when you explain that to a, a business, a little light bulb goes off in their head because they go, oh, I didn't even think about that. I didn't even know about that. And once they do, then they start going down this path of employment for people with autism, and the results can be really good. So that that's an area that I'm that I feel very encouraged about. You know, the housing issue is, is one that is a much bigger challenge. So Matt, could you talk a little bit about the relationship of the ARC San Francisco and the San Francisco Bay Area? 
Yeah, um, the, something I'm very proud of is the ARC is very interconnected with the community. I mm -hmm. mentioned our relationship with Ascend, mm -hmm. which is partly why I'm here, with the Specialist Guild, with a lot of the great companies. You know, we've been in San Francisco for almost 70 years, wow. and we have a great relationship with the city, with the police department, with UCSF, and so, you know, and with d various community colleges and four-year universities that, that all really help make a rich and interconnected community. That's great. Um, can you talk a little bit also about the relationship of the ARC San Francisco, the California ARC, and then the National ARC? Sure. So the ARC San Francisco is part of a national network of ARCs. Mm -hmm. There is an ARC United States, which is based in Washington, D.C., and that's kind of the umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. And their primary purpose is to lobby for, for federal legislation that is supportive of people with developmental disabilities in the system. The ARC California does that on a state level in Sacramento. Now we are a completely independent nonprofit as the ARC San Francisco, but we are part of this network of ARCs that all come together for conferences and also try to come together to make, to help do coherent and consistent advocacy efforts and messaging to the state and federal level. That's great. Are there any particular advocacy issues right now that we should be aware of? Most certainly, Camilla. <laughs> you know, the, the, the issue that's on the front burner is provider rates, which is the ability for us to do business in such a high-cost area. Mm -hmm. Now, the state of California commissioned a study by a consultancy firm called Burns & Associates mm -hmm. that just looked at the rate-setting system in California, and they're going to mm -hmm. be presenting their recommendations soon. And I can only assume their recommendations are going to say, you need to pay you need to put more money into the system. And the state is by no means bound by that. It's just a recommendation. And we need to put an advocacy effort across the state to tell the state of California we need to allocate more resources for this system. Otherwise, these services and supports are going to go away. How can individuals support that effort? They can do it in a number of ways. They can do it by contacting their local legislators. They can do it by going to Sacramento for budget hearings and giving public comments, mm -hmm. by going to rallies, by sharing their stories, and by connecting to local organizations like the ARC San Francisco who are connected to other advocacy efforts. We are part of a number of collaborations like the Lanterman Coalition, which, it, which does a lot of legislative advocacy part of you know the ARCA the association the association of regional center agencies we we can be a entry point to a lot of those collaborations and help people get access to letting their voices be heard on the state and national level it's great to hear um, I'd like to ask you about another issue that ASCEND members are very concerned about we are interested in providing social opportunities uh, for our members and for the larger autism community how does the ARC um, participate with that yeah, you bring up a very important point, mm -hmm. especially because, you know, after the recession of 2008, a lot of the funding for more social opportunities was cut by the state. So there's not a lot of funding for that, and it really has to come from the ground up. But first of all, it addresses, I think, a really inaccurate stereotype that people with autism mm -hmm. don't need social connections, mm -hmm. that they, you know, um, they absolutely do. And again, you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. There are people that are most social and people that are less social. And opportunities are absolutely essential for any of us in our life. Now, the ARC San Francisco addresses that partly through our Friends Like Me program, which is an evening social group that is privately funded and it's not, doesn't receive any funding from the state. Um, and then we also just do what we can to help connect people and build relationships. But I think that's something that it really needs to be addressed. And all of us at Ascend want to say thank you to the ARC for allowing us to host our social events there and for allowing us to meet there. It's been a really important part of our program. It's a pleasure and an honor. That was super. Now, Matt, one of the primary uh, programs that you, or focuses rather, that uh, you mentioned the ARC has is employment related. And as uh, you know, this is something that's of really big interest to me individually as well as Ascend overall. Can you describe some of the initiatives toward employment that the ARC is doing? Yeah, so we, we focus a lot of our energy on employment and on outreach to businesses. And it's really about education and about messaging, which is that employment for a person with autism doesn't have to be, it can be 
you know, being a bagger at Safeway. Nothing wrong with that. But if people have other ambitions, that's something they have the right to pursue and that with the proper supports, they oftentimes can pursue. So it's about, as I had mentioned, t t explaining to businesses that this is a good business decision. It's beneficial to you as a business and getting that message across. And by doing that, it really helps. Once, it, once one business is successful, they tell their colleagues and then it, and then it starts to spread. Could you elaborate a little bit on, on actually how that is done? Or say, do you do it uh, for a group of uh, our clients? Do you do that on an individual basis? Or can you tell our viewers a little bit more about how that typically advocacy process works? Yes, well, we, well, well let me actually start with w working with the individuals. Yes. And we do it both on a group level and on an individual level. As groups, we have classes that teach people employment skills, teach people soft skills in the workplace, teach people you know, basic things like the importance of showing up on time to maybe more nuanced uh, aspects of the social environment at the workplace and, and work performance. Then with individuals, we work on their individual goals and skills. Mm -hmm. And then we have job developers that go out to the community and to businesses and to tell them about what we can do for them. And then if a business agrees to hire us or to hire one of the individuals we're supporting, then we provide a job coach who can be at the workplace at no cost to the employer or at very small cost to the employer to help facilitate the integration into the workplace for that individual. And then once we do that, we try to leverage those connections at, at those businesses. And, and once they hire one person, they often want to hire more. We often use internships as a way in. Mm -hmm. uh, the Regional Center now funds internships. So we have internship programs that train interns, send them to businesses where they get to do a paid six-month internship, which often can result in employment as well. Excellent. Uh, going forward, what particular challenges, both to uh, our clients overall and more specifically toward the autistic members of uh, the community, do you face in dealing with employment? Um, there are still lots of prejudices to overcome. While I'm very proud of the inroads we've made to the community, if you look at the big picture, they're still very small. So there is much progress to be made. I think that's the that's the primary challenge, you know, and it's it's also the challenge of having people who are, can afford to live here mm -hmm. to be able to help support them getting employment in the Bay Area. Tell us about family support. Well, f families are key. You know, this whole developmental disability system, regional center funding, all this was created because of families, because of family advocacy. The Arc San Francisco was started by families. The place I worked before, Lifehouse, was started by families. It's, you know, when I go and talk to a politician about the importance for funding the system, they can choose to see me as a guy who just wants to keep his job, even though I'm coming from a place of, of, of deep passion. Whereas if a family member is talking to a politician, they cannot doubt that individual's motives. That's, that's where the real genuine honesty lands with the politicians. So families have to be involved in this. And families can be a very important provider in providing supports. Not everyone's lucky enough to have a family, to have a family who's involved in their supports. Uh, but those that do can have a, a great advantage, not just from the advocacy level, but also as a partner with with the service provider. Uh, you know, we at the Arc San Francisco, one of the things I'm interested in doing moving forward is really uh, connecting with our families and, you know, building a family group that can come together and share stories with each other and also have a, a forum to be able to talk to me and share their ideas and concerns and we can talk about the direction the organization is going and what kind of needs and supports that their family members are having that are being met or what needs aren't being met or what needs or the future might be there. So I, I see families of, as a very important piece in this whole puzzle of trying to make people with autism fully integrated members of our community. Tell us about your future plans. Well, you know, my future plans are on, on the big picture is to make the ARC San Francisco an effective and strong organization that can help pursue our mission of creating rich lives for people with developmental disabilities and autism in our community to help people to help our community appreciate neurodiversity. Now, you know, the 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 details of that, part of that is really continuing to grow our employment program. And not only that, but 
because we've had such success with employment, we have developed a, a great deal of expertise, and we want to be able to share that expertise with other organizations and other companies. So we're developing a plan to really be able to teach other organizations how we how we engage with businesses and to teach businesses how to engage with organizations like us to make them as successful as possible, which I think is a way that we can make this happen, not just on a local level, but to make it spread all over the city, all over the state, all over the country, maybe all over the world. And that, that's really what we're trying to do. While at the same time, keep pursuing advocacy for affordable housing, um, keep working with with funding from the state to make sure that someone who identifies as a resident of the Bay Area gets to live in their place of choice and gets to be a fully integrated member of the community. Hello and welcome to part three of the Einstein Book Review mini-series. Today's book is Einstein, His Life and Universe by Walter Isaacson. This is one of the most comprehensive biographies of Einstein ever written. Einstein has long been suspected of being on the autism spectrum, and the book provides some support for the idea. In one episode, after Einstein got into an argument with another scientist, the other scientist wrote to Einstein, had you devoted as much care to understanding people as to understanding science, you would not have written me an insulting letter. Isaacson describes this as a telling point and true. Einstein was better at fathoming physical equations than personal ones. Einstein wrote back to the other scientist, you must forgive me, particularly since, as you yourself rightly say, I have not bestowed the same care to understanding people as to understanding science. This illustrates that Einstein, with all his scientific genius, did not understand people, but why? Was it really a lack of care, or could it have been something else? How could Einstein, with one of the greatest scientific minds in history, be able to understand esoteric physics concepts that few others could grasp, but not understand something as intuitively understandable as people? The answer is that for people like Einstein, and for many others on the autism spectrum, physics is what is intuitively understandable, while people are just as mysterious and baffling to them as physics is to many neurotypicals. Later in the book, Isaacson provides some additional insight into Einstein's personality. Isaacson states Einstein did not like to be constricted, and he could be cold to members of his family, yet he loved the collegiality of intellectual companions. As long as someone put no strong demands or emotional burdens on him, Einstein could readily forge friendships and even affections. A scientist who knew Einstein wrote, I do not know anyone as lonely and detached as Einstein. His heart never bleeds and he moves through life with a mild enjoyment and emotional indifference. His extreme kindness and decency are thoroughly impersonal. Einstein himself reflected, My passionate sense of social justice and social responsibility has always contrasted oddly with my pronounced lack of need for direct contact with other human beings and communities. These are all autistic traits, shared by many on the autism spectrum. Although they don't prove Einstein had autism, they are highly suggestive that he did. Isaacson, however, does not believe that Einstein had autism because Einstein, quote, made close friends, had passionate relationships, enjoyed collegial discussions, communicated well verbally, and could empathize with friends and humanity in general. Well, thank you very much, uh, Matt tarver Walquist, CEO of Art San Francisco. Uh, as a final note, uh, how can our viewers who are watching this program uh, get more involved and find out more information about the Ark of San Francisco? Well, our website is www.thearcsf.org. That's the A R C S F dot org, and there you can find you can find me. You can find any way to reach us. Well, thank you very much again. Uh, we wish you continued success both individually and for the Ark overall, and we are very grateful. Uh, to all the services that you provide to our community as well as to Ascend and Specialist Guild. Uh, last of all, I want to thank uh, our hosts, in effect, uh, Dwayne Morris here in San Francisco. And uh, finally, I want to thank our viewers. So for this week, I'm Keith Halperin. I'm Matt tarver Walquist. I'm Camilla Bixler. And I'm Will Burnick.
and until next time, uh, we're Ascend Life on the Autism Spectrum. Take care. Music